Welcome to episode one of The Mechanics of Meaning. You might have thought that, for the first episode, we would take a look at a really story-heavy, narrative-driven game, but no. Today we're going to talk about Dice Wars, a browser-based flash game made by a site called GameDesign.jp. It's a great little strategy game, super addictive, and lots of- Yeah? Yeah, I'm serious. Yeah. Where are you going? Hey, no, 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 come back here, please! Please! Oh. Okay, I know this might seem like a strange choice, but trust me, Dice Wars does some really interesting things with its gameplay. Plus, as you can see, the design is very... Uh, minimalistic, so we don't have to work as hard to untangle the gameplay from the visuals, the audio, and so on. Talking about Dice Wars will also let me introduce some fundamental concepts that will come in handy for discussions of more complicated games later on, so it's actually a perfect subject for our first episode. Okay? Good, then let's get started. First, we need to talk about how the game works. Before we get into it, I encourage you to try the game out for yourself and make your own impressions. There are links down in the description, and this is your last chance to go into the game with a blank slate. So. How does one play Dice Wars? At the main menu, you choose the number of players, sort of a mislabel since it's actually one player against one to seven computers, and then you hit play. The game presents a randomly generated map with regions and dice distributed between yourself and your opponents, and asks if you accept this starting point. Click no, and it'll generate a new board that will hopefully be more to your liking. Click yes, and the game begins. The turn order is random, so some of your opponents might go before you, but when it gets to your turn, you click on one of your purplish-blue territories, and then click an opponent's territory to attack. You each roll your dice and add up their value. If the attacker gets a greater number than the defender, the attacker wins and takes over that territory, leaving one die behind. If the attacker's number is less than or equal to the defender, the attacker loses all but one of their dice. You can attack with any territory that has more than one die and borders an opponent, and you can attack as many or as few times as you want during your turn. When you decide to end your turn, you gain dice equal to your largest number of connected territories, which are then randomly allocated. Each territory can have up to 8 dice, and if you max out all of your dice, any leftovers are banked for your next turn. The goal is, quite simply, to take over the entire map. We're going to come back to this later, but for now it seems clear that these are pretty simple mechanics. There's nothing too inherently complicated or intricate about the game. But the mechanics work together to create a cohesive and compelling experience, which will become clear as we talk in more detail about two key elements. Chance and strategy. Chance, or randomness, is often treated as the opposite of strategy. When someone is an expert strategist or planner, we even say that they don't leave anything to chance. And at a certain black and white level, this contrast makes sense. Imagine that I asked you to play a very simple game with me. I flip a coin, and you guess whether it will land on heads or tails. If you guess correctly, you win. If not, you lose. We could play this game over and over again, hundreds or thousands of times, and it probably wouldn't matter if you guessed heads every time, or alternated between heads and tails, or anything else. There is no strategy that will help you win at this game. It's just pure chance. Even in games that aren't completely or entirely random, chance is still seen as antithetical to strategy, because it's an element that we cannot control that we can't 100% account for. Since strategy is all about control and planning, chance is often viewed as a negative. We see this a lot in video games with players bemoaning the RNG, or random number generation, that can influence many different parts of a game, like the equipment and items you get, how much damage an attack does, or if the attack even hits. On the flip side, there's a game that doesn't have any form of chance in its game design whatsoever, and it's often held up as the pinnacle of strategy. Of course, I'm talking about chess. Chess is sort of distilled strategy. 
Every single game of chess has the same component parts, so to speak. The same board, same pieces, same movements. Players can strategize purely based on their choices and those of their opponents. There is uncertainty, perhaps, as to what one's opponent will do, but not randomness. Kurt Vonnegut once wrote a short story called All the King's Horses. It's a compelling story about chess, strategy, and Cold War geopolitics. And I'd like to share a quote from it here, specifically from the character Barzov, a Russian major. It's a very distressing thing about chess, said Barzov. There isn't a grain of luck in the game, you know. There's no excuse for the loser. Dice Wars is decidedly not like chess in this regard, and is very upfront about its incorporation of randomness. Dice is right there in the title, after all, and it shows in the basic gameplay. In chess, if you take an opponent's piece, you always win that battle. It doesn't matter if it's a pawn attacking a queen or vice versa. In Dice Wars, though, victory is almost never a guarantee. Here are the ranges of possible rolls for every number of dice from 1 to 8. Note that victory is literally only guaranteed in two specific circumstances, when attacking one die with either 7 or 8 dice. In all other cases, victory may be very probable, but not certain. You could employ the optimal strategy in Dice Wars and still lose. There's a very low probability of that happening, but it's still possible. There are plenty of potential excuses for the loser, as Barzov would say, but Dice Wars is a single-player game. You're really only making excuses to yourself. Besides, Dice Wars is still fair. All the players slash computers have the same mechanics for success and failure. It is also still a strategy game. Your plans and choices might not exclusively determine whether you win or lose, but they certainly affect the likelihood of a win or loss. What is strategy, after all, but a series of if-then statements? If my opponent makes X move, then I will respond with Y. Even trying to think ahead and predict your opponent's actions just means flipping the script and imagining you were your opponent. If my opponent does Y, then I will respond with Z and then you plan to counter Z. The strategic behaviors in Dice Wars and Chess are functionally very similar. It's just that the sources of uncertainty, the ifs, are different. Chess focuses solely on your opponent's choices, while Dice Wars incorporates random chance. Humans generally tend to be better at understanding and evaluating conscious agency and intentions than raw probability. We're pattern finders, after all, and we excel at interpreting or imagining reasons behind phenomena or behavior. Randomness thwarts us because there is no pattern, no agency, no intention, no reason. This is why so many players bemoan RNG in video games. And some of them even jump to the conclusion that the game is rigged against them somehow. That pattern, that intentional behavior, is more readily imagined than chance just not going their way. These ideas and principles will be really important for us going forward because games tend to use both random chance and active decision making in their games in different forms and for different purposes. In Dice Wars, for example, you control your own choices and can predict how your opponents will behave, but the dice rolls are always random. It's important to know and distinguish these types of mechanics so we can evaluate how they shape the game and the player's experience. Specifically for Dice Wars, these factors mean that players will almost never be able to guarantee a particular outcome, but they can affect the probability of successful outcomes as they learn the game and how to strategize, which brings us to our next topic. Dice Wars tells you almost nothing about how the game works. When you start the game, you get two short sentences of instruction that are mostly about the controls, and that's it. Here's a slightly condensed transcript of my description from part one of how the game is played. The green text signifies any information that is explicitly given to the player, which is not a lot. 
Yellow text denotes information that could be reasonably inferred or figured out pretty quickly. Finally, red text denotes information that could be harder to figure out on your own and might take some time to piece together. As you play, and over successive rounds, you will learn more about how Dice Wars works, which enables you to more effectively strategize within each individual round. For example, it can take some time to figure out that you gain dice based on your largest group of connected territories, but once you realize that, it has clear strategic consequences. Keep your territories together, split up enemy territories, and keep hostages that consume enemy resources without contributing to them. The game becomes iterative, evolving over multiple playthroughs, and we need to pay attention to what happens both within playthroughs and between them. Even if your strategy doesn't work in one round, and that specific strategy doesn't apply in the next round, you can still learn things to refine your general strategy and approach, to build a more nuanced library of if-then statements. A similar principle undergirds many other games like Dark Souls and Celeste, where you are encouraged to accept failure as a step on the path to success. One of the loading screens in Celeste even tells you to be proud of your death count, because it shows how much you have learned. But that's a discussion for another time. The key principle that I want to carry forward is that we have to pay attention to both how the game works, that is, the mechanics, and how those mechanics are communicated to and learned by the player. The sort of meta-mechanics of the game, if you will. And now, finally, I want to actually talk about what Dice Wars means. Dice Wars is obviously a very abstract game, using a very simple aesthetic throughout all of its elements. It has a limited correspondence with reality, especially compared to hyper-realistic games, but even compared to something like Civilization or The Settlers of Catan. This abstraction enables or even invites us to interpret how the game could be mapped onto real-life experiences, similar to the function of allegories and fables. It might not be very meaningful on the literal level, but if we pursue a different interpretation, we might find something valuable. So, how would we interpret Dice Wars? The game could probably be interpreted in multiple ways, but the most readily apparent angle is suggested right there in the title. War. What does the game seem to be saying about war? A lot, actually, if you look closely. The secret here is to think about elements of the game and what they would correspond to in a more realistic situation, as well as considering why they're abstracted in the first place. To start with the most immediate question, if the game represents an actual war, what do the dice represent? Resources? People? When you lose dice, either from a failed attack or by being attacked yourself, does that represent people dying? Note too that the winner of a battle doesn't actually gain dice, they just don't lose any. The only way to actually gain dice is to end your turn, but there are limits to how much you can gain. Eventually, you have to lose dice or gain new territories in order to have enough room. In terms of specific strategies, remember that ties always go to the defender. This, combined with your limited resources, encourages you to pick your battles carefully. Wanton aggression will likely be your downfall. Further, the largest number of connected territories rule promotes coordination and keeping your territories together rather than a divide-and-conquer approach. The abstraction itself also plays a role. You view the action from an extremely macroscopic perspective, like some indifferent general far away from the battlefield, literally calculating the likely outcomes in your head and coolly making choices. If we could zoom in somehow, maybe we would see soldiers fighting back and forth, killing and dying over the same scrap of land but the player just sees another roll of the dice. Finally, the randomness that permeates Dice Wars portrays war as chaotic and subject to chance. You could have a distinct advantage in a battle and still lose. You could strategize and execute perfectly and still be defeated in the war. Once again, you can contrast this with chess, 
a similarly abstract game that nonetheless can be interpreted to reflect on war in a very different way. In chess, war is similarly detached, but far more methodical. There's an art, even a sort of elegance to it. There is no elegance in Dice Wars. Now, I deliberately ramped up the pretension at the end there, because there's a solid chance you aren't really buying this interpretation. It's just a game about dice, you might say. There's no allegory here. You're reading too much into it. If you are thinking that, I have good news. You're absolutely right. Well, sort of. To explain why, I need to talk about the biggest thing that Dice Wars has to teach us. So, is Dice Wars a nuanced socio-political commentary on the nature, strategy, and ramifications of war? Or is it a silly flash game about colorful dice? It's both. And probably a whole bunch of other things, too. Each individual's interpretation is shaped by their particular experience with the game. Different individuals will have different experiences, so of course they could have different interpretations. As well, games feature a lot of divergent possibilities, like gameplay choices, dialogue options, and yes, even chance. To portray one choice, one outcome, or one interpretation as superior or more important than the others is incredibly reductive, especially when trying to discuss the mechanics of a game. I'm less interested in any one option and more in the total range of possibilities, along with the fact that a choice was even given in the first place. So we can't just affirm one possibility. We have to affirm them all. There's a concept that I'm going to borrow for this, and I want to give a quick heads up to any physicists watching. I might get this wrong. In my defense, you're watching a YouTube video about the literary interpretation of video games, so I think we might both owe each other apologies. The concept I want to use is called superposition. In quantum physics, the superposition is the sum of possible states of a given system, particularly when its specific state is unknown or unknowable. The most famous example of this is the thought experiment called Schrodinger's Cat, in which a cat trapped in a box exists in a superposition of both life and death simultaneously. The superposition is said to collapse when an observer opens the box and the cat is either alive or dead. This is a very quick summary. Uh, if you want a more detailed explanation, there's a link in the description of this video. I use this concept here to explain one of my guiding principles in analyzing and talking about video games. To the extent that it is feasible, do not collapse the superposition. In this case, that means don't pick one possibility as the absolute truth above all others. Of course, when playing a game, you can't help but collapse superpositions all the time. If a choice comes up, you have to pick one of the options. You can't pick them all simultaneously. And that's fine, but someone else might pick one of the other options, and that's just as fine. So whenever I can, if there are multiple possible outcomes in a game, say, dialogue choices, branching storylines, varying interpretations, or, yes, even a dice roll, I will try to maintain the superposition. If it's relevant to my analysis, I will discuss the range and some of the possibilities, rather than elevating any individual option. Furthermore, if I do present a single interpretation, remember that it's just one of many possibilities. So yes, Dice Wars is a subtle critique of the nature and consequences of war, and it's also just a neat little strategy game about dice. By looking closely at the mechanics of the game, we've learned some core principles that will help us analyze even more complex games in future episodes. In the meantime, Thank you for watching episode 1 of The Mechanics of Meaning. If you enjoyed the video, please feel free to leave a like or a comment, and consider subscribing if you want to see more videos like this in the future. I also encourage you to share this video with anyone you think might enjoy a 20 minute video about a colorful dice game. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.